So when I was asked to do this talk, um, I had a number of conversations with these gentlemen over here. And uh, they said, well, we wanted you to talk about cultural stuff. And then somebody else said genetic stuff. And uh, somebody else said demographic stuff. And so I thought, well, you know, that's about seven books worth uh, done superficially. So uh, what I'm going to give you is a, a selective story. I'm going to talk about the past and um, the ways in which the past influence the kind of population change that we see in the world today. I'm going to try to get you to recognize that there are things about the world we live in and the changes that are going to take place in that world that are in many ways similar to what happened a thousand years ago and that we faced a lot of these sorts of challenges in the past. We just have new versions of them uh, coming down the pike and that we have succeeded uh, by and large in dealing with them in the past. So there's some hope for the future. Um, in the course of this thing, I will be talking about some basic demographic measures. Um, my definition of demography is that it is the science of measuring the human condition. It tells you what people are like, it tells you what state they're in, it tells you how they feel, um, how well they're doing in terms of their health, all that sort of stuff. And it's a measuring kind of science. And so I'll just run over these measures real quick. I think you've heard of most of them, but it never hurts to be reminded. The first is life expectancy, and this is always defined for a newborn person. So you're born into this world. What is the expected age at which you will die? So the average age of death is life expectancy. It sounds much better when you say life expectancy than average age of death. So uh, we, we call it that. Total fertility rate is the total number of kids that a woman would have over the entire span of her reproductive life. A woman is capable of reproduction starting just past menarche, technically. So maybe 13, 14, we'll say 15 years old, and becomes incapable of having children after menopause, which is somewhere around 50. So it's a 35-year reproductive span. And the idea in total fertility rate is you say, let's look at, say, the United States today or Canada and ask the question, if the birth rates that exist today applied to a woman over her 35-year reproductive span, how many kids would she have? And the answer for the United States is about 1.9, and for Canada, it's something like 1.7, I believe, but something of that nature. Um, risk. Uh, I can tell you the average age at which you're going to die, but the question is, how certain are you that, you, that that number is a good number? Suppose I say, well, the average age of death is going to be 75, but it turns out that you could actually die as early as 45 and as late as 105, then that's a big spread and there's a lot of risk, uncertainty associated with that. So a measure of uncertainty is the variation in the age of death. And then we'll talk a little bit about income. I won't say too much about that, but income is clearly a measure that's used to tell you how people are doing. So quick 30-second summary of the history of the species. Um, Anatomically, modern humans evolved about a quarter of a million years ago, and they spent a great deal of time after that being essentially hunters, gatherers, and foragers. And the world was a pretty nasty sort of place. It was cold most of the time. Um, and then we get to the Holocene, which starts about 10,000 years ago, and the planet starts to warm up. And this is a picture that you'll find in lots of places. Uh, the one I'm using is due to this guy, Sherat. Um, and the graph here really represents the level of temperature. And you've got calibrated years BC and calibrated years before present up there, whichever one you want to look at. If we look at the top, so we've got 10,000 years before present, and then we go backward. 
from 10,000 years before present, which is sort of here, up to here, that's when things started to get really warm, you can see. The glacier has melted, and you could sort of walk around and, and do stuff. Um, and that led, not too surprisingly, to early agriculture. That was a huge transition in the history of the species. And so early agriculture, and it, this was accompanied fairly rapidly by husbandry, that is, the domestication of species. Okay? We went out and we got species like cattle and sheep and pigs and so on and so forth, and we started using them to do lots of things as a food source, as a food storage mechanism, and as a way of adding nitrogen content to the soil. So, early agriculture went on for a long time. As far as we can tell, for many thousands of years, there were changes occurring, and we'll talk a bit about them, but the changes were not massive. They were qualitative, and they were slow. And during that period, the first thing we are reasonably sure of is that life was, in the famous phrase, nasty, brutish, and short. Life expectancy was 25 to 30 years. And it was probably at that level for many thousands of years. Now, that's a pretty short life. You know, you figure if there are any grad students, uh, I know there are some in here who are older, but there are some, I'm sure, who are just coming out of a bachelor's degree or something like that and entering grad school. Well, then you're going to be about 24, 25. Well, think of a world in which that was the average age at which you keeled over. Uh, Definitely a different world. Life was also uncertain. Even though the average age of death was 25 to 30, the variation in the age of death was about 25 years, which meant that you had a pretty good shot of making it to age 50, but you also had almost equal probability of dying at age 2, something like that. So a lot of uncertainty. The total fertility rate in that period was high. And it was probably around five kids per woman in that range, five to six. The generation time of the human population was then and is now and will remain about 20 to 25 years. That is kind of a number which tells you if, if I have a group of women and they have their kids at various points and so on, at, if you think of sort of the center of gravity of the population, how long does it take for that center of gravity to be replaced by the next group of young people produced by the original set? That takes about 20 to 25 years. And there's something that I will also talk about, which is the net reproductive rate, which is how many kids replace you. Okay? And if that number is one, then one replaces one in the population stationary. If that number is bigger than one, then the population increases. And the net reproductive rate for a very long time was fairly close to one. And the population grew at maybe half a percent a year for thousands of years. Um, net reproductive rate, something to, you know, the other thing, context in which you might want to think about it is disease. You know, you have influenza and you have a flu season. And the flu season, think of the net reproductive rate of the flu. You get the flu, you walk out, you cough on some poor soul, and they have a very high probability of getting infected. So you walk into your neighborhood uh, coffee shop, waves across the street, you cough, everybody in there gets it, and so on and so forth. The net reproductive rate of the influenza is enormous. It's something like 15, 20, 25. And that's why it spreads so fast. Compared to that, the human net reproductive rate is kind of tiny. OK. Now, I want to talk a bit about a question that I think many people do not appreciate, and that is, rather than thinking about human population and its relationship to, say, resources, I want you to think about what a population consists of. And a population always consists of young people who are just learning how to do stuff. And it consists of working people who actually do the stuff that enables the population to persist. And then it consists of older people who are no longer able to do the stuff. Okay? 
So that's sort of a basic classification, and it's been with us from the beginning of time. It's not new. And when you think about a population, you've got three possibilities. One possibility is that the population is declining. What decline means that you, know, you aren't generating enough kids to sort of pump the population back up, and that leads to what I call a, to an inverted population pyramid. So if you look at that thing, it looks sort of like this, and the reason that the base is narrow is that the width of those bars is an indication of how many people there are at different ages. The bottom of the bar, uh, the, the structure, those bars are the youngest folks. The next bar up, slightly older. The next bar up, slightly older, and so on. So you're going from young people at the bottom to old people at the top. If you are not producing enough young people, then what's happening is that that bar of young people is, is getting narrower over time, right? You are not producing enough people to really regenerate the population. And you end up with an inverted pyramid. The second kind of pyramid is one where the population is roughly constant. And in a population with high death rates, it looks like a pyramid. And the third thing is where you actually have population growth, and in that case, the pyramid looks like that. Now, what I want you to notice about this is, if you've got this kind of pyramid, you have a lot of young people. If you have that kind of pyramid, you have a lot of old people. Who's stuck in the middle? The people doing the work, right? So if you think of working ages as being between, say, I don't know, 20 and 50, or 15 and 50, something like that. Now, you know, this is not a personal statement about any one of you, or me for that matter. I'm long past that kind of working age. But um, I still work. And um, the definition I'm using is one in which I'm saying between the ages of 15 and 50 or 20 and 50, most people are in the labor force. And they, this was true whether you were talking about farmers on some distant plain in, I don't know, Mesopotamia or something like that 10,000 years ago, or whether you're talking about folks in offices today, right? So what happens is you get this kind of sandwiching effect. And you get what's called a dependency ratio, okay? The number of workers per person in the population depends on the growth rate. If you've got a pyramid that looks like this, you've got a lot of young folks. If you've got a pyramid that looks like that, you've got a lot of old folks. Somewhere in between has got to be a sweet spot, right? And along the horizontal axis here, I've got fertility. If fertility is very low, that means I've got a pyramid which must look like this. I don't have enough kids coming into the system. If fertility is very high, then I've got a lot of kids coming into the system. The pyramid looks like this. So at this end of the world, you've got a lot of kids, and you just have a lot of kids. So working people have to support those kids. At this end, you don't have very many kids, but on the other hand, you have a lot of older folks. Okay? Now, clearly, that balance depends on how long people live and so on. But this picture is generic. This is what happens in any human society. And it's happened since the beginning of time, since the first people went out hunting and gathering and, and early farming developed the whole bit. <coughs> so you get this kind of pattern where there's some intermediate range of fertility at which this, the number of workers is the largest in proportion to the population. If you have too few kids, the number of workers in proportion to the population declines because you have too many young people. If you have too few kids, it declines because you've got too many old people. Okay? Uh, so this thing is what I call the de dependency frontier. And this is really important for any society and always has been because it tells you how much stuff that population can produce, essentially, right? Because the people who are doing the hunting or the gathering or the tilling or the whatever are the workers. Everybody else has to eat what they produce. 
back in 2,000 years ago, say, it was food, really. That was the primary thing. But there were also other things. There were things that formed clothing, there was firewood, there was whatever. Now, maybe the workforce is writing apps for the iPhone or whatever, but they are producing output, and that output then has to be spread out over the population. So, first thing that happens is you have a dependency frontier. The second thing that happens is what do those workers do? Well, they produce stuff. And so here's the number of workers per person. As that number increases, production ought to go up, right? Because you've got more people working. But if you keep increasing the number of workers, eventually they run into limitations. And the limitations are space, usually. If you're talking about a community back in the day when you couldn't go to work in a car, they were restricted by the distance they could walk comfortably to their fields and back. They might be restricted by the topography of the region. All of these effects are limiting factors which kick in if you have too many workers trying to cultivate or hunt and gather or whatever in some finite bounded area. So this is kind of the generic shape of the production frontier, so to speak. And what happened with early humans was that you had this production frontier and you had the dependency frontier. And the two, where the two meet, that's where the world sort of settled down. So you had an equilibrium in which you had to have enough kids so that you could produce enough workers in the workforce so that they could feed everybody at some level. Okay? And this was a stable thing. This could maintain itself. And the thing to remember here is that back in the day, 2,000 years ago, 500 years ago, and even 200 years ago, your probabilities of survival and your chances of having a kid were fundamentally dependent on food. Okay? Early human life was not paradise. It was generally a fairly hungry existence. And we have done, lots of people have done lots of work on this question. And it seems pretty clear that for most of human existence, until about 200 odd years ago, the general mass of the populace was sort of hungry most of the time, okay? They never had enough food. They weren't really sated with anything. And so they weren't producing as many children as they were biologically capable of, and they didn't live as long as they might have been biologically capable of. So they were kind of in this equilibrium where they just kind of kept shuffling along. Now. You know, that's fine as far as it goes, but unfortunately, this equilibrium is a tenuous affair. And the question is, why is it a tenuous affair? So the first thing you can think about is you can ask, in one of those early societies, what are the constraints under which people have to live? And, you know, you depend on the climate, you depend on soil, uh, climate affects plant and animal growth. For example, let's say that you are, I've worked uh, some on Hawaii. <coughs> How many people have been to Hawaii? And Hawaii is a tropical paradise, no? That's beautiful. But think about a, a population of early agriculturalists who arrive in a canoe from Tahiti, and they bring with them some sweet potatoes, and some pigs. And they look around, and Hawaii is basically a series of inverted ice cream cones. It's a volcanic island, right? If you look at Hawaii from a distance, from a boat, that's what it looks like. And you kind of look at those slopes and go, you know, what the... And so what you do is you, you go out and you try to plant stuff. Now, it turns out that if you plant, if you take sweet potatoes, which you have brought from Tahiti, they're sort of used to tropical climate, so you think, excellent. But 
it turns out there's an enormous temperature gradient in Hawaii from the tops of mountains to the bottoms. Anyone, uh, any among you who have gone to Hawaii and have taken you know, the trip to one of the volcanoes or done one of the hikes, you will observe that as you climb up, it starts to get awfully cold. And you're up there in your shorts and your t-shirt going, hey, yeah, cool. And it's really cool up there. <laughs> it's freezing up there. So there's an enormous temperature gradient. And those plants do not do well when it's cold. So you can't grow much high up the slope. As you get towards the base, towards the seashore, where we might feel really comfortable, the plants don't like it either because it's too hot. So there's kind of an intermediate zone where you can cultivate things. So there are constraints, climate and topography places major constraints on plant growth, and it also places constraints on animal growth. There's resource depletion, and this can be fairly simple stuff. Like it turns out that in Hawaii, nitrogen is in really short supply in the soil. Why? Don't have a clue. But we do know that in a lot of places around the world, there are plants which fix nitrogen, which collect it and gather it, pump it into the soil. So when you come bumbling along as a human farmer and you plant something, that nitrogen is available for you, and so your productivity can be high. Eventually, humans figured out, aha, we need nitrogen fixers, and they sort of got with the program. But before that, a lot depended on the conditions that they were given. And in Hawaii, nitrogen, there wasn't much of it. So you really had very severe constraints in terms of how much food you could grow. Then you have a disease environment. And uh, when I first started working on Hawaii, uh, I, was, I did some work using skeletal remains. And I said to my colleagues, well, life expectancy in Hawaii you know, 1,000 years ago was probably around 30. And they said, you're mad, man. Hawaii is such a beautiful place. It's paradise. You know, what's going to kill people over there? It must live forever. No. Disease environment is fairly simple things. One of the biggest killers of people for all our history is, is E. coli. We carry around an immense number of bacteria in our guts. And back in the day when you didn't actually have a way of disposing of human waste in a sensible, safe, controlled fashion, you know, it sort of commingled with a lot of other things, and it produced disease. That's a disease environment, and it's one which is human-generated in part. You've got pigs running around. You know, I mean, it, it, think, think back. It was undoubtedly a fairly messy sort of environment in that respect. There are other environments where people had disease vectors to deal with. Malaria, schistosomiasis. I mean, some of these things you can go back and you can find traces of those diseases in bodies like mummies in Egypt have been found to have schistosome eggs in them. Well, schistosomiasis is a tropical disease, but it goes back many thousands of years. It was there. And so the disease environment is a constraint, and it's one which varies from place to place, but it's, it's, it's a big deal. The next thing that serves as a constraint is social organization. And by this I mean, you know, do you have a, a sort of a stable social configuration around you? Do you have mechanisms of exchange? You know, maybe you specialize in growing sweet potatoes, and, and uh, the fellow over the hill is uh, growing taro. And you think, well, you know, I'd like to go out there, and I'm getting bored of the sweet potato diet, and I'd like to do a trade. Well, if in order to do a trade, you need some kind of social mechanism, an agreement about the fact that you can come to some reasonable exchange, and that if you wander over there with your sweet potatoes, he is not going to simply hit you over the head and take your sweet potatoes and say, ciao. So you needed that. Then there was the question of taxes. Uh, as I'll mention in a moment, <coughs> one of the earliest forms of human social evolution, don't ask me why it happened that way, but it did, was the evolution of hierarchies in which you had chiefs of some kind. And as soon as the chief became a chief, 
the first thing the chief did was to wander around and say, well, I want some of those sweet potatoes and I'm giving you nothing, except I'm not gonna hit you over the head, right? So taxes were collected in many of these societies, but did they do any good? And the answer to that is, were the taxes used for infrastructure? Infrastructure is a big word these days, and when we think infrastructure, we think freeways, um, internet systems. But back in the day, infrastructure simply meant, for instance, building a retainer wall so that you could keep the wind off your farm. It meant building very small structures which formed natural water storage and things of this kind. Okay? So a lot of the early part of human evolution consisted of processes which we can observe which involves changes or adaptations. I'm unsure in many cases whether these really were adaptations or whether they were simply changes that happened to occur. The difference between them is a change is something you just sort of stumble upon and you find that Joe's wearing shorts and what a wonderful idea, we don't all have to wear long pants, so you start wearing shorts. Now, and adaptationist view of the same question is that Joe decided it was just too damn hot and he spent a long time thinking about what he ought to do and he said, well, maybe if I do that, you know, I'll be cooler and so he shorts came back. I don't know. Some of these things clearly were one or the other, but we're not sure. The first thing that humans have been doing since pretty much the beginning is plant and animal selection. And you think, well, how did that come about? And it comes about real simple. You wander off in the brush and you find yourself <coughs> some bushes, and you, you decide that you're going to try the fruit, and the fruit tastes good, and you say, okay, excellent. And you remember where that is, and then you, you, know, you bring someone else along, and then you walk around, and the person tastes a bush, three bushes down, and says, this stuff is terrible. And you say, okay, rip that out, because it doesn't taste good. And so next year when the bushes grow, you know, we won't have any of the crappy ones left. That's selection. And humans have been exerting that kind of selection forever. And it's not, you know, it's not something necessarily systematically thought out or scientific or whatever, but it's, it can be very strong selection, and it was. So we had a lot of selection on plants, and we had a lot of selection on animals. <coughs> the selection on animals had to do with how easy they were to push around, okay? If you had a particularly strong-willed individual, cow or something like that, who insisted on sticking horns into you every time you asked the cow to do something, you said, nah, the heck with this. Stab him and roast him or whatever you want to do. But you had selection for characteristics that made plants and animals uh, more useful and more valuable to people. Incidentally, one question that I've never understood the answer to, and I've asked lots of folks, it falls into this adaptation versus change thing, is how did we learn which plants were poisonous, right? So you got this big thing with mushrooms. I mean, I, I had this fantasy maybe 20, 30 years ago that I would learn how to find chanterelles in the wild. I like chanterelles, and so you go on the Santa Cruz Mountains and you find tons of these chanterelle things. And uh, so I talked to a friend of mine, I am in a biology department, and he said, I hope you didn't eat any of those. And I said, why not? And he said, because you've got these things called fake chanterelles, which look just as good as the real thing. But if you take a bite out of those, so I said, uh, do explain. So, and, and I don't know the answer, but I've got my own theory. And my theory is the let's get Mikey theory. So, <laughs> you know, if you remember this TV ad, which has the three kids, and uh, they're given something to eat, which is supposed to be good for them. And one looks at the other and he says, I'm not trying it. And the second looks at the third and he goes, let's get Mikey. <laughs> so, and then if Mikey keels over, you know it's poisonous. Maybe that's the way it went. I don't know. Um, but we certainly did a lot of that. We did a lot of exploration of, you know, the sources of food in the world. Um, and then there was coevolution. And I'm going to come back to this. But coevolution, an example of this that I will return to, is the fact that in a number of populations, we actually had evolution which consisted of an increase in the frequency of genes which allowed adult people to drink milk. 
This is not something that we, we, we had at the dawn of time. Some people had those genes, but by and large, you have a tolerance to milk and ability to digest it when you're an infant. But as soon as you become you know, a year or two of age, you start to lose that ability very quickly. That's sort of the typical pattern. However, there was coevolution in the sense that populations which were pastoral populations, where they made their living by domesticating cattle, had a lot of milk, and they needed to do something with it, and they weren't farming, so they eventually got better and better. That's one way of putting it. What that means is that the frequency of the genes which gave adults the ability to digest milk increased. Now, you think about it from the flip side, that meant that you know milk was the only thing around, and they were pumping it into them, and so the ones who didn't have the ability kind of went... And that's selection for you, right? So that's how gene frequencies change. But that's coevolution because you have domestication. You're changing the cattle to suit your needs. They are providing you with the food that doesn't suit you. So you change to meet that. And so this is a typical kind of process. Agricultural technology. Fancy sounding term, but actually, if you go back and you look at the um, historical record, it's really simple stuff. Like in Hawaii again. Um, one of the things about Hawaii is it's volcanic, right? And some of the islands of volcanoes were only you know, a few thousand years ago. Some they were a long time ago. And so a lot of the areas in Hawaii which you might want to cultivate are covered with kind of a crust, which is left over by the volcanoes. And it's very difficult to plant stuff in crust. So what do you do? Well, the Hawaiians came up with something which, in retrospect, you say, well, yeah, sure. But they came up with a digging stick. And this was an evolutionary step. Somebody came up with this technology and got a stick of a certain length, which was efficient to pound into the ground, and they sharpened one end of it into a blade, and they made it of just the right size so that you could dig a hole in that crust and you could plant a sweet potato slip in it. That's technology. <coughs> and gradually, technology got more complicated. People figured out how to fertilize, and they figured out the plow, and so on and so forth. But that took a long, long time. But there was a lot of technological change. And then we modified our environment. We figured out how to store water, for example, to try and get past water shortages, and what have you. Social organization. Well, as I've said, that evolved tremendously. And we started out most likely with chiefdoms. And along with chiefdoms came social hierarchies. So the, the chief and the chief's family and the chief's brothers and all these people rose to the top of a hierarchy. And everybody else was subordinate in some sense. The chiefdoms gradually gave way to something that we call archaic states, which are ancient states. And they're a little more complicated than chiefs, chiefdoms. Because you don't just have one chief. You might have sort of a paramount chief and then a bunch of lesser chiefs and so on and so forth. So you've got a much more intricate system. And then we got feudal states. And feudal states were around, I mean, most of Europe, for example, and large chunks of the world were feudal states until the 1800s. And Sweden started to become a parliamentary democracy um, in the 1800s. They were a feudal agrarian society before that. So this ain't all that far in the past. And these states, these hierarchies, they had things that were like taxes. They had tributes that was collected by the chief or by the hierarchies. You had taxation. And we know that they did produce some infrastructure. In Hawaii, for example, the chiefs had areas of land which were their areas. And commoners were not allowed access to them in general. But in times of famine or shortage, those areas were, in fact, available for cultivation by the commoners. The chiefs developed these fish ponds. Some of them still exist in Hawaii. And they are ponds that were actually created in the coral rock formations close to the coastline. And they're very cleverly designed. And they, they set them up so that they have small, uh, that they're open to the tides but they have small holes in and out. 
And so little fish can get in, but big fish can't get out. And so if you wander around one of those ponds, you will find that you know, the little guys migrating in, and they get bigger and bigger. And the chiefs res reserved this right to themselves. Those were chiefly ponds. Nobody else could fish in them. But in times of famine, some of that was made available to people. So that's a form of infrastructure. And one of the positive roles of these hierarchies was um, to provide infrastructure. Another thing that evolved, clearly, was social norms. You know, things like you don't just hit somebody on the head because you feel like it. You know, that's a, bit, a social norm. You, you have some method of communication and exchange, uh, and you can do so in some peaceful, organized fashion. Now, remember that a lot of these early societies were quite violent, but their violence tended to be concentrated on outsiders. So we evolved a big outsider-insider thing. And I'm sure that some of the, you know, we have a lot of this left over that we have, you know, he or she is one of us, and he or she is not one of us. You know, we still have a very strong primal kind of um, social context that we operate in. We're getting over it, but slowly. The other question about this is variability. Okay, all of what I've talked about so far tells you, well, okay, you know, so you, you got digging sticks and so you could plant more sweet potatoes and so on and so forth. But variability was really a big deal for these guys. Climate change was massive. As far as we can tell, a large number of early populations went extinct because of climate change. Remember, climate change has been around for a long time. It's just the mechanisms have changed. And the sort of climate change I'm talking about is if you remember that picture I showed you about the temperature series, the one thing that will have struck you, I trust, is that it goes like that, right? What that means is that over any given 500-year you know, period, temperatures were highly unstable. And this has continued for a very long time. So we've got all sorts of civilizations that, as far as we can tell, with reasonable degree of confidence, collapsed because they confronted long droughts, like the Maya, or the um, um, Native Americans in, in the American Southwest. These were really intricate, fascinating civilizations that had developed a lot of technology and that seemed to be just you know, cruising along. But then they got hit with a drought. And it wasn't just a one-year drought, a two-year drought. It was a hundred-year drought. And you can see a record of this in the Southwest in, in tree rings. Now, a hundred-year drought... I mean, even we'd have difficulty coping with that. But these guys just didn't have a chance. And so societies collapsed because of those sorts of things. But on an annual basis, you had enormous variation. If you look at rainfall in, uh, pick any place in the world you want, and look at the year-to-year -year variation in the rainfall, and it's enormous. It's really staggering. And temperature varies along with it. In dry places, you know, the range might be small, but it can go all the way from having nothing to having relatively for that place a lot. And in very wet places, it can go all the way from catastrophic to just a lot. But those sorts of variations were very difficult for early farmers to deal with. One of the reasons was, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, resource change. So, for example, what they early... Um, foragers, when they started becoming farmers, the first thing that they did was they'd go, they'd find an area, they'd set fire to all the trees in that area, and then they would plant in that area. And they'd get a great crop. You can still do this, if somebody will let you. And you'll get a great crop. But then, if you try to do this again and get a second crop, it's not as good as the first one. And if you do it the third time, it's pretty crappy. That's resource limitation. What's happening is you're planting all this stuff and you are using up a lot of the nutrients that you put into the soil because you burned those trees. So people had to develop a way of coping with that. Epidemic disease. Uh, we've talked a bit about that already, but that's one of those sources of variation. And social. Uh, taxes were a problem. You could easily tax a society 
out of existence or um, to the point where they really wanted to change. Crime and conflict were problems, and war. So again, how did we deal with this? The first thing, you used many resources. Um, if, you, if you look at the ethnography of many ancient farming societies, especially ones where people lived close to a coast, you will see a typical story is that they went and they farmed in the spring they planted, and they waited, and then they got their crop. That was the end of the crop deal. They did not have food storage technology. You harvested, you came back, and you ate this stuff as long as you could. If you got a particularly good harvest, the tail end of it was going to be pretty rotten stuff that you were eating, but that was what it was. And then in the winters, you went to sea. You went to the coast, and you got shellfish, and then if you had developed the technology of boats and fishing, then you went first into the near shore and then uh, further offshore. So your reliance on marine resources went up dramatically um, in times when you weren't getting anything from the land and vice versa. You also did a lot of hunting and foraging where it was possible for you to do so. Technology. People started developing storage technology. The first storage technology known to man is a storage pit. And actually, it makes perfectly good sense. The temperature, if you start digging down, you'll find that if you get, you know, oh, about a meter below the surface of the Earth, the temperature fluctuations there are a lot less than at the surface. And if you go three meters down, the temperature stays really pretty constant all year. So you can throw a bunch of sweet potatoes or other things in there, cover them up, and that's your storage technology. A more sophisticated form of storage technology is a pig. Right? You feed the pig whatever you can, all the scraps, and <laughs> the pig is stored food on the uh, moving about. And then there was fallow, and you know, all sorts of so fallow is where you you've got a number of plots of land and you work one for a while, then you leave it alone to recover, and then you work a second and you come back. Migration. You moved around a lot. And you have examples in early Sweden, um, uh, places like that, where people owned or had some control over five or six plots of land, all fairly small, maybe three times the size of this, this surface here. But they'd work one, and then they'd leave it alone, and they'd go off and work another, and then they'd leave it alone, and so on. <coughs> For the social stuff, we had an evolution of power structures of various kinds. Some of them lasted and some of them didn't. Social norms. And social norms included institutional norms. That is, we started clearly to develop rules about how chiefs behaved. Okay? They had, in many cases, essentially arbitrary power over the people that they were chiefs of but they, there were limits on the exercise of that power. And these were norms of behavior. They weren't things that you could easily counter. <coughs> um, social norms, again, are a response to this. If you have food shortage, you increase sharing behavior. Um, there have been studies of populations, hunter-gatherer populations, in which people have found they do a surprising amount of sharing. The most successful hunter will go out and kill something large and bring it back, but this person will share it with the rest, even though he clearly doesn't have to. And religion. Religion was something that, if you look back at the history of the spread of religions, the spread of religions often coincided with periods of epidemic disease. Because epidemic disease put a lot of stress on the social system. And religions provided rules about caring for the sick, about um, maybe uh, various kinds of rules which amounted to isolating sick people but taking care of them without allowing the disease to spread. And you know, a whole bunch of other things of this sort. So religion was undoubtedly something which served a number of useful functions in coping with variability. 
OK. What are we time-wise? Is anybody awake? <laughs> it's, oh my god. Uh, no wonder you're asleep. Uh, OK, so let's move on. Um, 1700 to 1850, major transitions began in Europe. And what happened? The first thing was we got three big changes. Philosophy, the Enlightenment, scientific, and institutional. OK? Um, and most of you know all about this. And if you don't, look it up. Uh, these were precursors to the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution starts sort of about 1850. It really takes off around 1900, and it changes the world. <clears throat> the first thing that happens in the Industrial Revolution as it progresses is that productivity change becomes a big deal. Until then, productivity was not a big deal because there wasn't much variation in it. You know? So may maybe you were a really industrious bloke, and you could wander out there and work 10 hours. And your neighbor could work only six. So yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd grow a little more stuff. But there wasn't, you know, there really wasn't much else that productivity amounted to in early agriculture. However, with industrialization, things changed. You had vast new sets of tools at your disposal. You could fertilize. Um, you could exercise systematic uh, selection on crops. You could learn from other people about their selection on crops. Information was exchanged. Productivity change became a big deal. Now, if you think about any society, at least for the present, we tend to think of GDP, gross, gross domestic product, as being sort of a big thing. It's the size of the economy. What is the growth rate of that? Of that? It's the sum of two growth rates, the growth rate of the number of workers and the growth rate of the GDP that each worker produces. This is productivity, output per head. So the growth rate of productivity and the growth rate of the labor force, those are the two long run drivers. I mean, that's just basic um, arithmetic. Now, this is one reason why, even though in this series, you're going to hear from a lot of people about how population it has negative effects and impacts and so on and so forth. A lot of the world, especially economists and people concerned with economic policy, are obsessed with the rate of growth of population. Because imagine a world in which the rate of growth of labor is negative. That's what declining population means. Well, that's a negative number, and that means the growth rate of GDP instead of getting a contribution which is maybe a little positive or something, is being pulled down. So you're going to have to pump up the rate at which you increase productivity enough to compensate for that if you want to maintain overall GDP. Okay? Important thing. Um, take another five minutes? Or... <laughs> well, there's nobody back there. <laughs> Uh, so the Industrial Revolution, it made productivity an important thing. And what has followed from there is very important. It's shaped the world we live in. And that is that the output per head, productivity, has grown much faster than population. And you know, for a long time, those two grew at about the same rate. That was the equilibrium I showed you before. Then 1500 to 1700, you start seeing sort of the glimmerings of this change, a little more in 1700 to 1820. And then from here onwards, you see the taller, the blue top, is the rate of growth of productivity, output per head. And the red bars are population growth rates. And population growth rate is positive, but it's been declining. And output per head has been growing at an incredible speed. That is what has made all the difference. It has taken humans and moved them beyond Malthus. Okay? Malthus was looking at a world like this. That was his kind of picture. And his view was 
you know, you can work as hard as you like, but all you're going to do is you're going to grow more food. If you grow more food, you're going to have more babies, and then you're going to have more people, and then you're screwed. You know, that was a big important. Uh, so that's the kind of thinking. But the Industrial Revolution changed that. It produced a rate of growth of output which so far exceeded population growth rate that the per person availability of stuff increased very rapidly and societies became rich. So after 1850, the world changed. You got organized, non, uh, that shouldn't be age, that should be ag, organized non-agricultural economic activity. Before that period, the only reason people thought about people was for the purposes of what was called political arithmetic. You wanted to count how many people there were in order to find out what taxes you could collect. That was the only reason, okay? Because there was no representative government, nothing. But if you, you know, if the Duke of bliggity blah had an estate and you went to him as the king and you said, well, I think I should have 4,000 ducats. And he said, no, 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 2,000 is the most I can afford. Then you say, okay, well, how many people have you got working for you? And so the counting of people, demography began as polit political arithmetic, and it's still that way. The only reason that most of the countries in the world, including the US, Canada, and so on, not the only reason, but a fundamental reason why our elected bodies fund the census is because it is used to determine voting districts. They gotta count how many votes they can get, right? And so they're never gonna stop funding the census. But the census, starting with this period, and in general, the process of looking at humans changed altogether. And we had the emergence of public health as a social and economic good. We're so used to it now, you know, it's kind of internalized. I talk to my students and I say, well, you know, around this time, public health emerged as a concept. And they go, huh? Because it doesn't occur to them that if you go back 300 years, nobody cared about the public, you know? I mean, they were just sort of things if you were rich. And if you were one of the public, then you, know, you had all these rich people running around doing crazy stuff. And your lot was to toil and sort of make it from the beginning of your life to the end. So the emergence of public health was an enormous step. It, and it coincided with those steps, those three things that I mentioned before. Uh, the enlightenment, a philosophical change, a scientific change, and um, Institution, thank you. So public health becomes a national and, and a global goal in the 20th century. Now you can go to almost any place and you can see you know, the literature that countries put out about themselves. And they say, our life expectancy rose by, or our child mortality rate fell by. 300 years ago, children died, you know, big deal. I mean, nobody cared. But this has changed. And a remarkable journey that began at the same time as the Industrial Revolution was the demographic transition. And this is what it looked like in most of Europe. These data are for Sweden. <clears throat> the blue line is life expectancy, which goes up from about 35 years in 1750 to nearly 85 years today. Okay? That's the average age of death. That's a huge expansion of the average length of life that a person can have. And fertility rate, well, Sweden back in the 1700s all the way through the late 1800s had fertility rates, you know, around four to five. Those are fertility rates that today we think of as insanely high. Okay. That was only 150 years ago in Sweden, for God's sake. I mean, you know, uh, we don't think of the Swedes as wild breeders or anything. <laughs> Very controlled people. Good people, sensible people. But like all human populations, they had high fertilities and high mortalities. That was just the way the, the world was. And then this incredible transition. This transition actually started in Europe. And uh, then it eventually started spreading to the rest of the world. <coughs> and between about the 1850s to about the 1950s, 
it produced the first real major global inequalities. It separated the first world, which went through this transition, and which had rapidly rising life expectancy, rapidly rising incomes and production, and then a period of rapid population growth, followed about 50 years later by slowing fertility, uh, and then the population sort of stabilized. And then there was the rest of the world, which didn't go through this stuff, which didn't have the Industrial Revolution, or many of the attendant philosophical, social, institutional changes. And there, life expectancy rose, but slowly. Fertility stayed very high. And the net result was that you had a slow but inexorable increase in population, which went on for a long time. Incomes were stagnant. Production was stagnant. And so what you ended up with was a third world, which sort of grew in number, but also stayed sort of constant in misery. Right? And you had a first world, which grew in number at first, but then kind of stabilized and economically just kept going. The good news, which some of your other speakers will get into in some detail, is that after about 1985, 1990, fertility decline has kicked in in most of the world. Um, and I won't say much more about that. Let's go back to this graph that I had before, which showed this, what I call the dependency frontier, right? That if, if you have too few babies, then you've got too many old people, and if you have too many babies, you have too many young people. So, you know, the, the worker to population ratio um, is something that has to have this kind of shape. What has happened in our time is that this whole curve has shifted. And the reason the whole curve has shifted is because we live longer, okay? But we haven't yet taken the steps to make people work longer. And we can discuss that if we have the time, but that's kind of the way it is. And so what's happening today is that we're operating in this kind of a range on this dependency frontier. We have fertility rates now in some countries that are approaching one. And I'm talking about fertility rate. This is the number of children per woman. If a woman has two children, then she's replacing herself and her mate. And if she has one, that's a 50% reduction in the stock right there. Japan is at 1.2. Spain is at 1.2 or 1.25. Italy, Portugal, um, almost all of Eastern Europe, you know, they just have staggeringly low fertilities. Now, why are these low? Because for most demographers, you know, you sort of thought, well, you know, people are going to have some kids anyway. And low means replacement. Nobody's going to go below replacement. Well, that's history. You know, we've just had to radically rethink the concept of what people regard as an acceptable fertility rate. And we don't know the answer. It could be zero. And in Japan, one reason you have such a low fertility rate is not that the average woman is in... So the demographers like weird terminology, right? So we like to say that a woman is at risk of having children. <laughs> so what does it mean for a woman to be at risk of having a child? Well, she has to have regular sex with a partner that, where she doesn't use contraception. Then she's at risk of having a child. Uh, and women have control over this, right? So what has happened in Japan is that the number of women at risk of having a child has shrunk. You've got lots and lots of young women in Japan who say, I don't want any part of this, and they use contraception and they don't marry. Ergo, they're not at risk of having a child. 25 years ago, I've done a lot of work in Japan and on Japan. And 25 years ago, they, they knew this was coming, and they started agonizing about it. And the funny part, well, this is just an aside, but Japan being a very male-dominated culture, even more so than we are, uh, they, you'd go to a meeting about the fertility problem, and you'd be in some nice room in Tokyo, and there would be 25 people in there and no women. 
<laughs> I'd sort of look around and say, uh, <laughs> you know, a slight problem, folks. Women are the ones who actually uh, have the children. No, 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 you don't understand, you know, the women. And the general conversation went along the lines of women are failing in their duty. <laughs> so when, when that conversation, those sorts of conversations started, um, Japanese fertility was about 1.6, now it's 1.22. And the first cohort of women who have completely taken themselves out of risk of having children has now turned 45. So they're, not, they're just not going to have any. So that is a real reshaping of the way in which women think about children. Now, you might say, well, that's fine. That's a dependency frontier. What about the production frontier? Well, the production frontier has become obsolete because of the Industrial Revolution. We're just now awash in stuff. Our problem is to find new ways of using the stuff, right? And one of the issues I will point out is that when we talk about production, which is what we tend to talk about, we all say production grew with this and that and the other thing, but consumption scales with production, right? If you look at the way modern economics works, it says that you have income and you consume and you save. The savings goes into making new productive capacity. And so if you look at any kind of scaling, you know, and people, um, who say we're using too much energy, always show you a graph. Energy production. But what about energy consumption? It's right there, isn't it? I mean, somebody's using that energy. It's not just being produced and sort of given away. And so our consumption has scaled with our production. And so we are, in some sense, we all have more stuff, but we are not free. We haven't freed ourselves from the limitations of having consumption equal to production. In some sense, what we keep thinking about is a world in which um, we can disentangle those two to some extent, and we can say, well, there's consumption that you have to have, and then there's consum consumption you could do without. And this is very challenging, right? So Arnie here rides a bicycle around, which is great for everybody except General Motors, you know, and Toyota, and Honda. <laughs> and, the problem is that he's, he's obviously doing the right thing, uh, but there are these automakers, and they make automobiles, which you buy and drive around. And if you decide tomorrow that you're all going to ride bicycles, <clears throat> what are they going to do? And you might say, well, I don't care. But, you know, they're part of the ecosystem that we've created. So, all right, moving on. Uh, instability in modern times. The dominant force for us is economic and social instability. And really, it's economic instability. And one of the key reasons it is is because consumption does scale with production. We don't have any slack in our economic system. right? So if you look at the economic system, you've got perturbations in it. You have these mini recessions and large recessions and so on and so forth, and you come out of it. And we have not figured out how to cope with economic decline, period. We just don't know how to do it. In the US, if GDP growth slows down, presidents lose their heads, at least figuratively. Treasury secretaries keel over and die. You know, I mean, heads of Wall Street firms have to downsize to a $10 million home. I mean, it's, it's really a problem. And, and there are people thrown out of work, and, and so on and so forth. So, Economic instability is a huge problem for our times. And we haven't yet figured out how to deal with it properly. Conflict and war, um, this still exists. Uh, and you know about as much about that stuff as I do. The stuff that worried the ancient peoples, climate, crop yields, and disease, we really got a handle on that now, boy. You know, we know how to deal with it. We do. We're pretty good. Now, the thing we don't know about or we don't agree about. Actually, let me rephrase that. There are challenges in, in that kind of environment which we cannot agree on. If you decide that climate change is not a problem and it's not a problem that's got anything to do with you, then we are creating a potential for disaster, right? Because it's occurring. It might have something to do with you and it might not. 
But you can't sort of make any progress if you say, no, it ain't happening. You know, I'm not going to look. Um, but if we leave out willful ignorance and deceit and so on, we can handle most of these problems pretty well. Resource competition, too, we can handle. How have we dealt with this? This is a very important thing. We came up with the whole idea of insurance. Insurance is an enormous deal in handling uncertainty. What kind of insurance? Well, there's life insurance, obviously. But crop insurance is a huge thing. The reason that modern farming is the kind of activity that it is, where farmers can maintain high outputs and where they are not worried about a bad year is because they have crop insurance. And crop insurance is usually social insurance, and sometimes it's private. But the farmer pays a certain amount of money every year, and if they have a good crop, everybody's happy. If they have a bad crop, then the insurance kicks in, and they, they survive. They make it. Right? <coughs> we have a lot of social insurance. We have social insurance covering health care. We have social insurance covering pensions. We have a kind of social insurance covering educational costs. Now, this is all, in some sense, good. You know, those are risks. We ought to be able to, to handle them in some way, and we ought to help people. We ought to have mechanisms in place. But the thing that we have to remember about this is that when we put these things in place, we rewrote the social contract, and we restructured the family. And we restructured human relationships. Because we said to kids, yeah, you don't have to worry about taking care of the old folks anymore, because they're going to have Medicare or national health or the Canada Pension Scheme or Social Security. Right? And so kids felt, not unreasonably, that, well, you know, just pay taxes for that. And uh, you have similar kinds of you know, changes in the social contract, which have become changes within the family and changes in the relationships between family and responsibility. Um, somebody was talking to me about Singapore, and that's a country which is incredibly rich and so on, um, but they don't have uh, the same sort of health care expenditure problems that, that we do here. And the reason is that in Singapore, if you look at the rules for health insurance, it says the first line of defense against falling sick if you're old is the family, your family, your kids. The second line is, is the state. We've taken the family out of the equation, right? And having taken it out of the equation, now we are running into economic instability. We get a recession, and uh, every clown in, in, in the U.S. anyway runs around uh, certain parts of the political spectrum, runs around saying, let's eliminate social insurance. Uh, this, is, this is very weird. Because it's, you know, we've taken away a whole set of adaptive mechanisms and put certain other ones in place. And that's what they're there for. Technology, we've got a lot of technology, all kinds, and it, it helps to cope with many of these kinds of issues. Um, certainly it copes with things like disease, with crop yield variation, with climate variation, and it can do more. And we've developed the whole business of collective behavior. And this is not just personal. Obviously, there are catastrophic failures, but nonetheless, it's national and international. You know, we've got the United Nations, and we've got the World Health Organization. And so on. These are really tremendous organizations which attempt to bring a lot of people together from different places, different countries, and so on, and get them to adopt collective behavior. Okay, so I think I'm actually going to skip over some of this. And since I promised to uh, um, say something about So I talked earlier about the fact that agriculture and domestication have produced these sorts of effects. 
And here are some examples. Uh, this is the milk example. Uh, lactose in milk is digested by an enzyme. This enzyme is coded for by certain genes. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the past which shows that the frequency of those genes is high in northern Europe and there's sort of a gradient. As you come down towards the Mediterranean, that frequency drops off. And if you go and travel in Europe, you'll find people up north, you know, they're still doing a lot of milk and when you get to the Mediterranean, they're doing cheese, right? So you're using different forms of milk protein which are easier to digest if you don't have the lactase. Uh, this is a recent study where people have noticed, so we know the European thing, but the nice way of confirming a coevolutionary story is to find another example. And the other example is you've got pastoralists in Africa. There are particular tribes that specialize in breeding cattle and uh, using them for milk. So they do, in fact, have the ability to tolerate milk as adults, and the question is how do they do it? And the answer is, it's a different gene, or it's a different polymorphism in the same gene region. It's very cool. But So you have two examples of independent directions of coevolution, but in response to the same forces. Second example is alcohol. Alcohol is digested by alcohol dehydrogenase. <coughs> and there are parts of the world where people don't have much of it. Japan's a good case in point. Two things you'll notice about Japan. A, every time you go out in the evening, everybody's getting totally blasted, right? Um, and B, they all look like they can't tolerate this stuff. You know, they all turn beetroot red and so on and so forth. And both are true, but that's an example of a situation where you wish they had the genes and they don't. <laughs> they wish they had the genes and they don't. But, you know, uh, one of the questions is, are there regions where you might expect people to have developed genes that allow them to produce some form of alcohol dehydrogenase. And it turns out that in southern China, there is such a gradient um, in space where close to the coast in areas where they grow a lot of rice, people actually have high frequencies of certain genes that help them produce alcohol dehydrogenase. Well, what does rice have to do with it? Well, what did you do with rice in the old days? All it takes with rice is a little accident. Okay, you get a container of it, don't try this at home. I do try it at home. You pour some water in there, and you just forget about it, all right? It ferments. It's got yeast and ferments. And in a lot of the world, you have things made out of rice. You've got rice wine, you have rice beer, and so on and so forth. So not surprisingly, there is evidence for this coevolution. And the other example that I found really cool was we domesticated dogs, and we know we got the dogs by domesticating wolves. I mean, all dogs descend from wolves. Um, but it turns out that if you compare wolves and dogs in, in terms of the genes they have, there are a number of differences, but one of the differences is in a region which controls genes that allow dogs to eat starchy foods, and wolves don't eat starchy foods. But kibble and dog chow, they're full of starch. And we eat starchy foods, so when we domesticated dogs, along with the many selection pressures that we undoubtedly put on those dogs, was we subjected them to a diet which most of them probably couldn't tolerate. And the ones who survived had some of these genes and the frequency increased. So these are some of the examples of coevolution. Finally, last picture. Uh, you know, what do we know about the history of human genetics? Well, one of my colleagues, a good friend, uh, Mark Feldman at Stanford has done a great deal of work on this question. It's now clear that we all came out of Africa. That's where it all began. 60 to 100,000 years ago, we were all there. <coughs> and then you had these great migrations. So about 50, 60,000 years ago, got up to northeastern uh, Africa and then crossed into the area that is now um, Turkey, and some folks went into southern Europe. Others went along the coastline of India and then kept hugging the coastline, eventually ended up in Australia. That was the origin of the aboriginals. They were helped along in many cases by the fact that sea levels were much lower then than they are now. 
There's lots of details to all of these stories. Another group, however, they must have been Canadians. They chose to go where it was cold. <laughs> and they went across, you know, that, that area up there has got to be one of the most difficult uh, bits of terrain to traverse. But they went all the way through and got into China. And then from China, there was, or part of that stream went up to Siberia. And then they crossed Beringia, which was frozen over at the time, and came down the coast of North America and went all the way down to the south. Um, and you can do some beautiful work uh, where you look at this from the standpoint of what are the genetic differences among populations, and uh, you can see very clearly the signature of this journey in, in genes from humans today. It's right there. <coughs> the only thing that I'm going to say about this is, and that's my last little bit, is one, there are two questions, actually, that I'll talk about. One is, how much genetic diversity is there between countries? Okay? Now, we'll leave Canada and the United States out of this because both countries are sort of a mishmash, right? Um, what was it Obama said? He said, I'm a mongrel. You know? <laughs> so both countries are you know, clearly the result of, of all these different immigration streams. But let's look at a country that we think is sort of homogeneous, like um, Norway. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and let's take some Norwegians. And let's take another country that we think is sort of homogeneous, like the Japanese, and let's compare you know, Norwegians to Norwegians, Japanese to Japanese, and then do the cross comparison. And the question you can ask yourself is, if I look at variation in some set of genes, um, and I look at a population which consists of some Norwegians and some Japanese, one model of evolution is that, well, the Norwegians are going to look a lot like one another, genetically, the Japanese are going to look a lot like one another, and the two groups will have a within, they'll have some variance within each group, but the between group variation is going to be dominant. This is false. If, if you do any kind of genetic study, you will find that variance is dominated by within group variance. You'll find two Norwegians who are as far apart as, you know, a person from Japan and a person from Norway, and probably further, okay? So within what you think of as homogeneous populations is most of the genetic diversity of the planet. And one nice demonstration of this is in this picture, uh, which is based on what's called the Human Genome Diversity Database, which we have at Stanford. And it was done by my colleague Noah Rosenberg. And these are you know, major geographical regions of the world. You can read the names. And you've got arrows going in and out. The arrows going into a region indicate the percentages of distinct alleles. And this is at a set of mitochondrial marker loci that are also found in other regions. And if you look at those inbound arrows, you will see all the numbers there are very, very high, 80%, 90%, things like that. That means that most of the stuff we have on our genomes is shared, or it originated from somewhere else. So there's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity on the planet. And uh, then the last question I'll leave you with is one that I often get asked, which is, okay, so we're living a long time, or we're, we think we're very smart, or whatever it is, compared to our forebears. Um, how much of this is genetic? You know, is evolution ongoing? Well, evolution is certainly ongoing, but evolution is pretty damn slow, okay? Except in rare cases, like artificial selection, evolution is a very weak process. And by that, I mean it takes a long time. It takes the standard rule of thumb in, in genetic, genetics is it'll take about 1,000 generations for evolution to move something, gene frequencies. Humans, 20, 25 years per generation. A thousand human generations, 25,000 years. The Roman Empire was 80 generations ago. From an evolutionary perspective, Rome is not even the blink of an eyelid away from us. So are we going to be genetically distinct from the Romans? Not by much. <laughs>
Okay.